has some secondary structure in it. There's an alpha helix. And we see a beta sheet. There's one beta strand, and there's another beta strand coming there. And so in this protein, we have regions that have regular structure, like alpha helix and beta strand. We also have regions that don't have regular structure and look more globular. This is a pretty unusual guy. We wouldn't actually see something like this normally. But this is drawn to illustrate to you the different forces that can hold together uh, a, a globular protein. And usually, with the possible exception of the metal one, you'll see all of these in a protein, in, in a globular protein. Yeah? And ionic. And the ionic. Yeah. So ionic, hydrophobic, hydrophilic, um, and disulfide bonds. Those all help to stabilize the tertiary structure. And the hydrophilic is a hydrogen bond, so I want you to th think about that. Okay. Okay, so those are now stabilizing forces. So we can start to see how not only the protein has its shape, but how the protein holds its shape. The more forces that we have holding it together, we can imagine the stabler that structure is. And it turns out that proteins vary a lot in their stability. There are some proteins that you work with in a lab that will drive you nuts. You spend years, I shouldn't say years, but you spend weeks purifying a protein so that you can study it, and you discover that once you've got it purified, it may be stable for a few hours. There are other proteins that you can pound on, you can beat on, you can boil, in fact, and they still keep their structure. They still keep their function. So there's quite a wide range of stabilities that they have. I won't talk about why boiling a protein or how boiling a protein can cause it to hold its shape, but if you're curious, I'll be happy to tell you some very cool examples about that after class. Okay. Um, those are the forces. Now, let's look at some examples then of um, protein structure. I'm not going to talk about the techniques, and you won't be responsible for those. All right? Let's look at a real good example. Here is a folded protein. It's a very important folded protein that we have uh, in our bodies. It's known as myoglobin. Myoglobin sounds like hemoglobin, and that's because it has a common um, uh, structure to hemoglobin. We'll see how that structure is related in just a minute. But suffice it to say that the amino acid sequence of myoglobin is very much like the, thing that, the things that we see in hemoglobin. Myoglobin has a function, sort of like hemoglobin. Myoglobin is a protein that we find in our muscles. And its function in our muscles is to function as like what I'd like to describe as an oxygen battery. An oxygen battery. What is an oxygen battery? Well, what is a regular battery? A regular battery is a source of power for you. If you have a computer that has, for example, an uninterruptible power source, it has a little battery in there, such that when the power goes off, the battery kicks in and keeps your computer running. How many people have a UPS? Nobody has a UPS. You like the power going off and your computer going down. Okay. That's what that does. If you have a laptop, for example, okay, your laptop has a battery, you unplug it from the wall, the laptop continues to function. The battery kicks in, does its thing, right? So the battery is a backup. An oxygen battery is a, is a backup of oxygen for your muscle cells. The place we find myoglobin is in muscle cells. Muscle cells need oxygen. They need oxygen because you like to run and jump and play. And having a backup source of oxygen is important because it's entirely possible for you to go running and jumping and playing faster than your blood can deliver oxygen to those muscles. That may seem a little hard to believe, but it's true. Maybe that's why you feel so tired in the morning, right? You're not getting enough oxygen to those muscles. Well, that's not quite what happens. But suffice it to say, that's what's happening when you're exercising very heavily. If you're out running a marathon, you're out doing a pretty energetic jog or a pretty energetic weightlifting, your muscles are using oxygen faster than your blood supply can deliver that oxygen. Now, what that means is if you don't have a backup, then the muscles get pretty cranky. Okay? That's why you get sore muscles, and we'll talk about that later. We won't talk about it right now. Having this backup is useful because when the oxygen concentration gets very low, myoglobin, which normally holds on to oxygen very tightly, 
gives up its oxygen so the muscles have an extra supply. Okay? Now, this guy is a folded protein. You can see it's folding. And it has a group that holds onto oxygen. The group that it has is called a heme, H-E-M-E. -E. So a heme group, I'll show you a structure in a second, but a heme group is a part of this, globin, uh, this myoglobin molecule, myoglobin protein, I should say. And the heme group holds onto oxygen. Yes, sir? So there's an iron in the heme group. It's not metal coordinating for the protein. It's actually helping to hold on to the oxygen. So it's not involved in a metallic bond, if that's the question. No. And where is the, um, how is it attached to the specific amino acid? I'll show, you, I'll show you the structure. OK? All right. So here's the heme group. It's a little hard to see on this figure. But it's, what we'll see is the heme group is a flat, planar structure. It is part of uh, the myoglobin molecule, but you'll see that this thing contains no amino acids. So here's something that's helping a protein to function. The protein gets a hold of this heme group and attaches itself to it. So this is not something that has any amino acids in it. And you'll see the structure in just a second. So um, let's take a look at it. Okay. So here's what that heme group looks like. Okay, so you don't see any amino acids in there. You see something that actually is a flat planar structure. It is coordinated to four different nitrogens that are um, holding it on this side. So if we look at this heme group, it would be like a plane. It would be flat. And the middle of that plane would be an atom of iron. Okay? In the middle of this plane is this atom of iron. So this is a group that the protein has gotten a hold of. It's, it's attached itself to this heme, and the heme has iron. When you hear heme, you should think iron. Hemoglobin has this group also. That's where it gets its name, hemoglobin. All right, so I've got a plane in the middle of this protein, and this plane has in it an iron. There are four groups that you see here, one, two, three, four, holding it in the plane, or at least close to the plane. And there's one group underneath it that's also attached to it. So heme, I'm sorry, the iron is held to the heme by four groups of this ring and one group underneath it of the protein. So one of the amino acids is making a link to this iron in this heme group. Everybody picturing that? OK. Now, I should point out that here's heme. Heme has a group called protoporphyrin, and protoporphyrin is something that we see for you plant people in chlorophyll. Chlorophyll has a structure in it that looks very much like the heme group. The difference is that chlorophyll has within it a magnesium instead of an iron. Very similar in structure. It's doing some very different things, though. Chlorophyll, of course, is capturing energy from the sun. The heme group is holding on to oxygen. So they have different functions, but very, very similar structures. Yes? So you would repeat the part that iron is held on to the heme by four groups. Okay. So, the, so we look, that's the, yeah, sure. The um, iron is held to, to, into the plane by four groups one, two, three, four. And that's the nitrogen, 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 nitrogen that you see there. Okay. It's also held underneath by one of the amino acids of the globin that we're talking about, the myoglobin. OK? Yeah? Is it, is it a specific amino acid? It is a specific amino acid. It's actually a histidine. You don't need to know that, but that's what it is. Okay. That will become important later. So I'm mentioning, I want you to keep in mind that there's one link to an amino acid in that protein. OK? All right. Now. It turns out that that link to the amino acid is very, very important for the function of hemoglobin and of myoglobin. So we're looking at myoglobin at the moment. Here's, that, this, here's those four atoms, one, two, three, four. That's those four nitrogens that you saw. Here's this histidine underneath it. And you'll notice that above it, there's nothing. That's where the oxygen comes in. So the iron will make a bond to the oxygen that's above it.
So when, the so when the muscles have a lot of oxygen, the myoglobin grabs all of it and holds on to it as much as it can. And it does it by a bond between this nitrogen and this oxygen. Nitrogen, I'm sorry, between this iron and this oxygen. Everybody with me? Yes. It binds O2. It binds molecular oxygen. And each heme binds one molecular oxygen. Yes, ma'am. Yes. So the iron is, so we could imagine if we, w if we would that my hand is the heme group. OK? The, let, me, let me go back. I'll, I'll show you the better structure. Instead of imagining it, let's see it. So when we look at myoglobin, what we see is here's the heme. And we see that the heme is held by the amino, ultimately on all other sides by this, the iron is held by one of the amino acids of that protein. Is that, does that help? OK, so the whole heme itself is held in place by the rest of the protein. And one of those amino acids of this protein is attached to that iron. So now it's laying on its side instead of laying flat. But it's still a flat structure. Everybody with me? Now, if you're understanding this, you're going to start to understand something very fascinating about protein structure. I think myoglobin and hemoglobin have some amazing properties. And I'm going to explain them to you in the rest of the period today. OK? So we have a notion in our heads of what heme is like in myoglobin. It turns out that very similar things we see in hemoglobin. So if you understand myoglobin, you're going to understand hemoglobin. Yes, uh, Tamara. In hemoglobin, there's four binding sites for oxygen? No. In hemoglobin, I'm sorry, yes, sir, it's in hemoglobin, there's four. So myoglobin only has one binding site for oxygen. So it can hold one O2 per molecule of myoglobin. That's correct. OK. So one O2 held per uh, myoglobin uh, in our, our muscles. All right. Now, if we look at this structure, we see, and I keep in mind now, again, we're looking at it sort of uh, from the side. We see those four nitrogens holding the iron. Here's that histidine that's an amino acid that's attached to the rest of the protein. So if we were to go, for example, it doesn't show it, but this guy is attached to the rest of the myoglobin molecule. OK? So this attached to another amino acid, to another amino acid, to another amino acid, et cetera. So we have a link of all the amino acids now that are ultimately connected to this guy right here. Everybody picture that? That becomes important because when oxygen comes in and binds, something really cool happens to myoglobin. And it doesn't have any big effect on myoglobin. But the same thing happens in hemoglobin, and it has an enormous effect. We'll see why that is the case in a second. When this oxygen comes into this site, oxygen has electrons. And iron is electron poor. It wants those electrons. So there's an interaction between them, iron being positively charged, oxygen being slightly, partially negatively charged. Okay. That's the attraction that's there. Well, it turns out when oxygen comes in, this iron wants this thing pretty bad. So what does it do? It raises by just a little bit to get closer to that oxygen. And by a little bit, we're talking about very, very tiny distances, fractions of an angstrom, very slight change. So what happens is it's not very clear here, but iron starts out slightly below the plane. And when oxygen is present, it moves up to just being just about even with the plane. So we see a very slight movement. That has virtually no effect on myoglobin. Myoglobin holds on to the oxygen, does its thing, and that's that. Okay. Understanding that very slight movement is going to be critical for our understanding of hemoglobin. Okay. So does everybody understand what I'm talking about now? We're moving this up very slightly when the oxygen is present. When the oxygen is given up and it goes away, then this, this iron goes right back down and sinks back to its earlier position. That slight movement is responsible for you guys being alive. That slight movement. We'll see why that's the case in a second. Questions about that movement or anything else that's on the screen here? Yeah. Yes. Smaller than one atomic radii. We're talking about very tiny motions. Yes, sir. Matt. It's attracted to it. It's attracted to it. Yep. And it holds it in place. It doesn't make a covalent bond, if that's the question, because it wants to be able to give that oxygen.